next track is called Performance Testing Measure and Metrics. And we give a warm welcome to Mark Tomlinson. Welcome, Mark. So Mark is the Chief Performacologist at Perf Bytes, currently working full-time as a performance architect at a startup in Philadelphia. Um, you can follow him and the other Perf Bytes on YouTube, Twitch, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Just search for Perf Bytes. So the floor is yours. Awesome. Mark. Thank you. Hello. Buenos dias. Are you ready? We're going really fast. All right. You're, uh, raise your hand if you're a performance engineer tester. Perfect. Then you know what the, oh, oh. Okay, this is your life. You give some graphs, pretty, pretty pictures, pretty colors. Green is good. Red is something failed, right? We have to have these colors and pretty graphs. When we put together metrics and measurements to prove that our work was valuable, it usually ends up in some kind of a graph or visualization. And if you're new to doing performance testing, the real question, how, how did you get those pretty graphs? Because usually we come up with some kind of a number that just says 42. What's the number? How many users? 42. It's also the question, the answer to the question of everything in the universe, right? So the two little graphs. 42. Um, and so I'm, hopefully I'm going to for a little bit of uh, metrics and measures. Oh, let's make sure we're good. We're still good. Okay. 42. Uh, metrics and measures. So we'll talk about metrics first, and then we'll talk about how to use the metrics and come up with what would be displayed as a measurement. Uh, myself, uh, I had a, a lovely introduction, thank you, Taz. I am a full-time performance architect, uh, and I play a special role in a fairly small company, running around doing performance work, infrastructure work. Uh, I am also do, in my copious amounts of free time, uh, Perf Bytes podcasting. Um, I also spend time teaching workshops uh, and doing education, mentoring, uh, but I'm also a guitarist. As a human being, I'm a musician. Uh, and uh, my friend Enrique, I earlier today is also a guitar. You heard the song of uh, the the sound of observability, uh, which is great. Uh, and we're also members of barbecue and the Perea. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to try to. This is not clicking so well today, so I'm going to have to change this a little bit. The agenda. I'm going to move that to see if that helps. Uh, our agenda today. I want to go through logical measurement metrics. I want to go through physical metrics ecological metrics, and then some application-level metrics to tie all these things together. And then we talk about measurements. So taking once you know what a metric is, then you can start taking measurements and sampling those metrics. We'll talk about trends and curves. We'll talk about performance correlations uh, and how you would visualize the correlation between two different metrics that are interesting and go through extrapolation. Uh, and extrapolation doesn't necessarily have to be evil, uh, as you may have heard. But it all starts this is going to bug me. Let's start with metrics. Logical metrics. Um, the number one logical metric, I say it's not physical, but is it sort of quasi-physical, is time. And it's, it's the only logical metric because it's really hard to measure it outside of some chronological, the sun moving over the planets. Uh, you look at uh, response time requirements and business requirements and store, user stories, end user response times measured in seconds. Service level response time measured in milliseconds, transaction response time of some seconds or milliseconds or microseconds even, batch job elapsed time measured in hours or maybe even days. We have some batch jobs or reporting jobs that could run for two or three days uh, depending on the size. Your service level agreements contractually, that's the other place you'll see time show up. I need to have uh, uh, an actual legal document that says this response time must be a certain level or less, one second or less, two seconds or less. Um, and so with everything else we measure in performance, it kind of comes back to time. And so we always hold that one, I always hold that one in my head as, you know, something is happening over time. Um, and so I want you to keep that in your brain as we move forward and talk about the next one, which is usage. So, or load, you've heard the phrase workload metrics. So number of connections, number of users, number of active threads, number of hits per second, requests per second. And then of course, over time, you have stuff happening and that becomes concurrency. Another word is simultaneity, which I hate because it's just hard to pronounce. Um, 
but concurrency. So how many things, volume, happen at the exact same time? So time and volume. So if I do nothing more in running some kind of a performance test or performance analysis, and I know those two things, time and volume, I actually can do some, some pretty valuable work. Um, but it doesn't peel away the next layer of the onion. Why is something slow? Why can't we do something concurrently enough? Why can't I support more transactions? Why is there a concurrency there? And usually, we find a bottleneck in the four core physical areas. The physical metrics start with CPU. How many of you have built your own computer? Good for you. It's an amazing way to learn these four core things. One, you have to buy the parts. Number two, you actually figure out how they fit together and how they work together. And you learn about compatibility. You can't just take any CPU and throw it in any motherboard. They have to match. Um, and so well, let's talk a little bit about physical performance characteristics for CPU. Um, come on. There you go. Uh, a processor is a central processor. Back in the day, there used to be sometimes only one digital central performance uh, processing unit in a computer surrounded by a bunch of analog circuits that supported the one digital microprocessor that was in the heart of the computer. And then, of course, as soon as you figured out how to make one of those, then you made two of those, then you made three of those. And now there's microprocessors and everything. There's probably a little microprocessor chip here. There's one in your phone. There's one in the screen right here, the audio systems. It's everywhere we look. There are multiple microprocessors. And they run with different architectures, like uh, CISC-based processing has a different architecture than RISC-based processing, different than EPIC or ARM. And they have these things called pipelines. So you can put a set of instructions from a compiler and have them two pipelines, a single pipeline or multiple pipelines, go into a single core of a processor. So if I'm, if I'm a processor and there's a bunch of application code that's come all the way down and it's gonna say, I'm going to say, all right, I can do one thing at a time. Well, now I have two pipelines. I can do two things at a time. Then maybe I can do six things at a time. At some point, I just can't do that much as a single processor, so then we have multiple cores. So you go to a quad core, go to four core, hexacore. The machine I have on my desk at work is 18 cores. Um, liquid cooled, really nice. Used to be, it's this big, it's fantastic. It's an amazing little machine, and I get to do lots of stuff with it. Um, when you're measuring, when you're, when you're looking at metrics or processor, you're pretty much looking at the total percent. Right? When, you, when something hits 100% CPU, 99% CPU, that's the max you can pretty much get out of a processor. Um, if you have two applications running at the same time, they sort of compete for who's going, going to chew up most of that processor. And if you have three simultaneous things running on a machine, like three separate VMs on a VMware box or a hypervisor of some kind, you'll have multiple things competing for a physical processor. And so we expanded the number of cores to do that. An interesting thing inside your application if, is the difference between system time and user time. So if you are running solitaire, because Roger, I know you enjoy the, this kind of doing quiet gaming time, playing solitaire, it's a, it's a, it's a serious part of his day. Um, it's, it's a process that only, user, uh, only Roger's user account is running. So solitaire.exe would run in user mode, right? Now, Let's say Roger decides he's going to do some browsing, and as he's browsing, he's saving things to the bookmarks, and he's downloading some files that go into the hard drive. He's using the network to get things downloaded, and he's saving some things uh, for work, some documents from a project, to his hard drive. Now he has to talk to system resources like disk and network, and he has to use the processor in order to talk to both of those peripherals. So again, if I'm over here and I'm the CPU, and Roger's doing the browsing, it's like, Oh, shit, he's bringing down some networking. Okay, so I got a file and I got to bounce that around. Then he wants to put it in the hard drive. So I got to go over here, put that in the hard drive, and then I come back over here. They get the next document and then I run here and I put it in the hard drive. Fantastic. So that is a really, it takes a lot of work for a little browser processor to do that, right? So what the system does, the operating system says, ah, any of those low level activities, I'm going to make them high priority. I want to get them done as fast as possible. Plus antivirus applications might be running in the background. Kernel mode drivers, anything that needs super fast priority gets system time. One interesting secret for you is if you ever monitor an application that has high exceptions per second, a wonderful metric, 
Exceptions, if they are system level exceptions logged by .NET or in Java, those exceptions, because it says the word system, they get system time, which means the application, this is some exceptional weird thing. You know what I need to do? I need this exception, take the stack trace, log it somewhere as fast as possible so that the application can keep moving forward. So if you have an application that's unhealthy with a high amount of exceptions per second, you get system time and everything else goes slow. It's a really interesting anomaly. Obviously, when you hit 100% of your CPU processing, you're done. You're pretty much pegged the CPU, buy more hardware, buy more CPU. And my important note, and you'll see a trend here this week, oop, increased CPU usage creates more heat, right? So if you've ever done something that's CPU intensive in your PC and you hear the fan, if your laptop, the antivirus turns on, the laptop starts going and the fans, right? You remember that? Terrible. So you're, you, with 100% CPU usage, you use more, create more heat and use more power and energy. Let's talk about disk, CPU and disk. I just talked about disk from the uh, downloading the reports that Roger was getting. This is, uh, this is as old as I am. This is more of what you guys might see nowadays, an enterprise level SSD, ultra SSDs, super fast SSDs that can go all fast, in some cases faster than the memory that we might buy for a machine. Um, and the disks are more like long-term storage, but because they're so fast now, they're almost used like an extension of your actual, the actual memory on the machine. So we park data there as an object within the computer. I need to log something, it's going to sit in the log for a while until we flush the logs out. I put something in an event log, it's going to hang around locally for a couple of days maybe on the event log. Uh, if I'm in a database, very different idea. For a database, you might be building a table and growing an entire huge number of records in a data file on the system itself. So it's long-term storage in terms of hours, days, or even years, and it's a measured in available bytes. So what percentage of the disk have you used, right? So moving, uh, I've got a terabyte, I've got two terabytes worth of storage, and it's on a very large array, et cetera. You're gonna measure uh, the data movement to and from in usually bytes per second. You might see it in smaller amounts, uh, depending on the context, um, but for the most part, it's number of bytes per second over time. How many bytes read, how many bytes reading, reading and writing and reading and writing. And if you try to read and write at the same time from the same drive, things might get a little bit slow. And it does, in the old days, it got slow because of the spinning platter, and there was only one needle or two needles or n number of platters. Now does it get slow because the actual microprocessor on the front end of the drive on the SSD is going to 100% CPU. Now I have a CPU on the disk that goes to 100% when the CPU on the computer goes to 0%, but the drive is waiting. Now you're talking about multiple processors on multiple drives and things get really confusing. Um, and that means you have latency. Refer to IO latency, so input output requests in milliseconds. With SSDs, you can have a high throughput, a high number of I.O. requests, IOPS, I.O. requests per second, but those individual requests should be incredibly fast. Uh, a, a big red flag if I ever see any drive, SSD otherwise, going at 10 milliseconds or more on a read or a write, there's some, something is seriously wrong, especially if it's an SSD. If it's an SSD, that should be tremendously faster per I.O. request. Um, so consider with this different roles, applications or databases, if you're logging, running queues, running virtual machines, those different application roles affect what that, uh, what that disk would do. The, one way to think about it also is that like CPU is really fast, memory is really fast, disk used to be the slowest component, and now it's pretty fast, it's a lot like memory. So physical metrics for disk are measured a lot more like an extension of memory. Come on now. Uh, and the important note at the bottom, if you push more bytes to and from a disk, if you've ever, you ever have an external SSD drive or an NVE RAM memory stick drive, an SSD that you can hold on to, if you're recording a video to that drive or copying things to and from it, it'll get hot enough to like you can't hold it in your hand. Uh, platters used to get that way, but yeah, anyway. So creates more heat, uses more energy. More heat, more energy. Physical metrics for memory, very similar to disk, except these are short-term places to park memory. 
And usually if you turn the machine off, the memory goes empty. A disk is persistent, memory is not. So you have short-term data in physical metrics on memory. And of course, that's more like way faster than disk. In fact, if you, for those of you that have built your machine, if you have frequency in the processor, but you buy slow memory, the CPU has to slow down in order to match the memory. So if you, get, if you buy an expensive CPU, but cheap memory, you're wasting your money on the CPU, and vice versa. If you get really, oh, I got really great memory, but I got this kind of slower CPU, you can't use that buff speed. The same thing happens in server computing when they build stuff. You think about Google building white boxes, they have done that spec and figured out exactly the right components to get them to match and operate at the same frequency. It's measured in available bytes. So bytes in use, available bytes, if I have eight gigabytes of RAM, 20 gigabytes of RAM, 100 gigabytes of RAM, in the box, you can see it being consumed. If there's a memory leak, it gets consumed really long. We'll talk about that. And if you usually have some kind of swap file, which is to say there's things that I'm getting some pressure in memory and I want to maybe, I don't want to keep it in memory. It's kind of stale. I'll just push this out to the swap file on the disk because I don't need it. So I'm, I'm, here's the processor. It says, okay, memory's kind of getting full and this thing's really busy, but I have these blocks of memory that I don't really need. Let's put them on disk. And so I take that and I take that memory and I come over here and I put it on the disk and the minute I put it down, I turn around and the application says, hey, can you give me those blocks? Go grab that, come all the way back from the processor and I have to put it back in the memory and tell the application, there, it's back in your memory. It's back in memory. So you get these kinds of slow operations that a processor has to juggle in order to get all of this stuff to work correctly. Um, so if you're working in .NET or Java or some of the other uh, uh, generational, object generational uh, languages and runtimes, there's this thing called processor cache. Processor cache has actual memory sitting on the CPU. So if something needs to swap or create objects really, really fast, let's say I create a string in .NET, that string gets created right here on the CPU. Because if in your code, if you've ever written your code, the minute I create a new object for a string, I bet you like two instructions later, I'm going to use that string. So why would I create that string over there in memory? And I could actually have, the, uh, have that string new created right there. Now if the string hangs around for a couple hours, I might promote it into Gen 1, Gen 2. If it's a really big string, I might have to put it into memory. So there's optimization built into .NET or Java for processor cache memory. This goopy thing there. Um, the active heap in memory can be uh, fragmented. It's kind of unusual in the hypervisor world. Uh, but applications can do all sorts of block swapping uh, and accessing memory in a very random way and growing things so you can have fragmentation. Um, with memory also, once you fill up maximum memory, you get out of memory errors. So you hit 100% memory, you're done. You can't use any more memory. And of course, if you buy faster frequency memory, it creates more heat uses more, it, it's operating at a higher frequency, so it uses more energy to do that, and you have to cool it just like you would the processor. Last one we'll talk about, I've done CPU, we've done disk, we've done memory, let's talk about network. Network is now the slowest physical resource within the computer. It has link speed capacities, here you've got anything from, you get a 10 meg, 1 gig, 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, Somewhere, somebody's probably got terabyte network speeds on a single pipe. We've kind of defeated that purpose with horizontal scaling. We can scale things out. You can do vertical scaling of networks, add multiple network interfaces on the same machine, team them together. And it's measured with percent bandwidth available. So on a single cable, if it's fiber or if it's uh, copper, you can only put so many bytes per second or bits per second usually down that wire. So if you have a very chatty application that's moving a lot of traffic back and forth, you look at the percentage bandwidth used. Um, look at the actual bytes, the actual throughput, and the indication that the network is unhealthy is typically in percent errors, could be packet retries or retransmissions. Something is causing the network to fail. It has to resend, oh, you didn't get that packet? Oh, you didn't get that packet? Particularly, well, UDP is very tolerant of that, but TC, most of our HTTP TCP traffic is handshaked such that it, it's, we need to send your packets, it gets there, it gets back. So if you have to retransmit packets, something is reaching its capacity, and you'll monitor that to see what's airing out. It could even be the CPU on the network switch or a router. 
that's reaching maximum capacity, and it's like, oh, I kind of, I'm not very, I'm not very good code. Maybe I drop some packets here and there. It can be a bad cable as well. And once your bandwidth reaches 100%, you are totally maxed out. You're done. Usually about 85%, it starts to throw errors, but definitely you can't use more bandwidth. You can't move more bytes than you, than you actually have. Oh, and guess what? The more network you use, the more energy you use. Because each network, your NIC card, the switch, the router, the, every switch between you and the server, those are all little microprocessors, and the more work they have to do, the more CPU, the more heat they create, the more energy they consume. So if we do more work, it's going to create more heat and use more energy. Now, there's a handful of other metrics to talk about, and particularly, hopefully, you've got my hint. Come on now. There we go. You're picking up my hints about ecology, heat, memory. I'm going to thank the abstracted team on, on Sunday. We were driving around uh, Uruguay, and I, we were just talking about climate change and talking about heat. And I thought, you know, I give all these great talks about CPU disk and memory and network and optimization, and I keep leaving this stuff out. So I'm adding it in. Uh, so ecological metrics that you may not ever be able to measure today, but I'll make it my goal we should figure out how to measure these things all the time. On my phone, I can see battery usage. I can see battery consumption. In, in my, in, on my homemade PC desktop, there's an app I can install to see the temperatures and the fan speeds. But on my enterprise server running my website, there isn't a monitoring inside the application when I'm running a load test. I'm not monitoring heat. I'm not monitoring T delta, which is the temperature difference from the front to the back of the machine. There's a coefficient for performance, which is how much energy to cool the BTUs being created. There's uh, some other stuff in HVAC for measuring efficiency of an air conditioner. Or, and of course, large data centers have air conditioners. BTUs are the British thermal units. So they have the BTUs per hour or watts per hour that you would use. The more heat you create, it takes energy to create that heat because you're using it. Then it takes energy to create the cooling to remove the heat. And in the end of the day, you've spent a lot of energy to just create more heat. Yes, you're streaming a Netflix movie and it's very intuitive. So where you have uh, instructions to write and the kernel says, oh, I'm going to go to the network. So it's even further than, <laughs> than locally. Uh, and I think uh, you didn't mention, but uh, I was wondering if it makes sense from your perspective to also figure out about the waiting time because the CPU sometimes... You're consuming CPU, but the CPU is not actually doing things, it's just it's, waiting. It's lag. It's yeah. the CPU lag. And in, in super microkernel computing, it's that it's your sleep zero. It's, it's latch. I, I, I only need to wait a fraction, like a super fraction of a microsecond to just try again to get to something. So latch time can be where that lag comes from. And of course, anytime you go across a wire, that's the speed of light or the speed of an electron can only go so fast, so it's going to add to that lag time for CPU acquisition of resource, right, the latch time. Uh, but that, that infrastructure where that time comes from is changing a bit. The uh, one comment I'll make about cloud computing is we don't start like with the free, woohoo, cloud, let's go, and then you expand a little bit, wow, the costs are getting up there. At some point, somebody says, well, we really need this to go fast, and the cloud vendor says, well, we can give you dedicated systems. And what are your dedicated systems? We'll remove the virtualization. We'll put you on, we'll just go back to good old data center rack space down the street. Oh, yeah, we're going to give you your own Kafka instance running on bare metal. And at some point, and I'm watching this with AWS vendors, I'm watching this with our own Azure stuff. Yeah, it's great for kind of these little ephemeral things, but if somebody who says, I really need the power, oftentimes will end up on dedicated provisioned hardware, which is just, that's just outsourcing the whole data center physical stack at that point. They get the convenience of the APIs. They get convenience for automation, but they're still chewing up juice the same way uh, to try to shortcut those lags. Okay. Um, that was all of our time. Thank you so much, Mark, You're again, very for everything. <laughs>